Hello, and thank you so much for joining this presentation. The title of our talk is Supporting School-Based Access with Visual Impairments. My name is Anna Perlmutter, and I'm the first speaker. I'll be followed by Molly Bennett and Julie Wolfman. Occupational therapists across Perkins campus collaborated to create this presentation. Perkins has a wide variety um, of students in a unique population. They provide services to individuals from birth to 22 years old, across the full visual spectrum and with multiple disabilities. We'd love to hear too about who is tuning in today. Looks like the majority of our audience is occupational therapists with 95% saying OT or assistant, 2% saying parent, guardian or caregiver, 2% saying SLP or assistant. And that is our audience. It's important for OTs and other therapists that work in schools to educate themselves on visual impairment because approximately 750,000 school-aged children are affected in the United States. One of the most impacted aspects of these students' daily life is their ability to engage in their education settings. There's limited research to inform best practice. When I started working at Perkins as a newly licensed therapist, I had to learn to adapt existing research to fit their unique population. This is a critical issue because it's so important to utilize practical and evidence-based approaches when evaluating and treating all individuals. Most of the available research is targeted toward interventions for older adults through the lens of productive aging. Often, evaluations and interventions are outsourced to specialized programs like Perkins because providers feel they aren't equipped to address visual deficits. Have you worked with students with visual impairments before? All right, so it looks like 18% of our audience is saying ocular impairment only, 6% saying CVI only, 59% with both, 12% saying sus suspected, and 5% saying none. It's so important for all occupational therapists working in a school-based setting to educate themselves about working with students with visual impairments because IDEA mandates free appropriate education in the least restricted environment. Districts are pushing more and more for students with isolated visual impairment to remain in schools in their local district. That means that more and more practitioners will encounter students with visual impairment. Our learning objectives today are as follows. Understand barriers to participation in education and school-based occupational therapy intervention for students with various visual impairments. Articulate how visual impairments impact the therapeutic process of evaluation and intervention, and how to apply learned intervention strategies in practice. First, you must understand the different types of visual impairment. Traditionally, it was understood to be the disease and conditions affecting the eye and optic nerve, which cause ocular-related blindness or visual impairment. But it can also be categorized as ocular or cortical cerebral. Cortical cerebral visual impairment is based in the brain. It's important to watch out for misdiagnosis as impairments based in the brain are commonly misunderstood and require different types of interventions than ocular impairment. Let's get into this in a little more detail. Individuals with ocular impairment have difficulty seeing visual information due to damage, disease, or a condition affecting the eye structure or surrounding components. Examples include glaucoma, cataracts, or macular degeneration. The processing structures within the brain appear to be intact in these situations. Vision is likely to maintain or potentially decline based on the diagnosis. Intervention approaches focus on modification and compensatory strategies. With CVI, individuals have difficulty processing or interpreting visual information. It's caused by the damage, disease, or condition affecting the visual center of the brain or its pathways. The degree of neurological damage and severity of the cortical visual deficit depend on the time of onset, location, and intensity of the damage. Eye exams may present as normal or close to normal, yet visual function is challenging. Intervention approaches include establishing and restoring visual skills. Over time, the student may learn to perceive more visual 
stimuli when provided with appropriate interventions, strategies, and adaptations. In order to work with students with visual impairments, it's important to have a basic understanding of the different impairments and conditions you might come across. CVI is the leading cause of visual impairment in children. It's caused by the damage to the pathways or processing centers. When I was at Perkins, about 60% of my caseload included children with CVI. Now that I'm in St. Louis, I'm learning there's plenty of kids over here too, I said as well. Retinopathy of prematurity is an eye disorder that affects immature blood vessels of the retina and occurs weeks after birth. Optic nerve hypoplasia occurs when the optic nerve doesn't fully develop during pregnancy. It can occur in one eye, but typically affects both eyes. Other common diagnoses include albinism and optic nerve atrophy. Knowing the causes of the different diagnoses is the first step, but it's also critical to understand how each diagnosis affects the student's function. So what is the impact of visual impairment on function? Children with typical vision take in information throughout the day by observing their environment, such as watching their peers perform an activity. This process is also known as incidental learning. Children with visual impairment miss this incidental learning and need to be taught these skills explicitly. Sensory processing is impacted by visual impairment. Without the visual component, or at least with decreased visual information, students require extra support to decode the meaning of tactile, motor, and auditory input. It's important to clearly define objects or features within their environment to support their learning. For example, differentiating bumpy, soft, rough, and smooth surfaces, or labeling a sound. Our brain's ability to recognize our body's location in space is heavily associated with the processing of visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive inputs. These three systems work closely together to help the brain feel organized and comfortable allowing for self-regulation and body organization. With the visual system missing information, students often experience challenges with body awareness, a skill which heavily impacts the development in the areas of motor planning, postural alignment, writing reactions, and participation in functional routines. As a result, students might participate in repetitive or stereotypical behaviors, such as head bobbing, or be drawn to more familiar play routines. Motor development is also affected. Young children might not move as much as their peers with typical vision because of fear or anxiety of unknown surroundings and people. Ear hand coordination doesn't develop until the child is around 12 months old versus hand eye coordination, which develops around two to three months. Also, a child will be less likely to lift their head during tummy time because they will not be as drawn to or aware of visual information around them. This affects their neck and core strength, shoulder stability, postural stability, and oppositional motor patterns. It can also delay crawling, walking, and manual skills. These delays can impact children into their school years. When engaging with peers, children often struggle to understand or imitate nonverbal communication and cues affecting their social participation skills. Um, I had a student at Perkins that was slouching, resting her head on the table, and not facing her peers when socializing in a group setting. She required clear feedback for how to position her body so that she appeared interested and engaged with her peers. Although her friends in her classroom also had a vision impairment, they also um, still had some functional vision. She had no idea that she looked disinterested and now works hard to attend to these details when socializing. It's really important to provide feedback to your students to help guide them through social interaction so that they can be successful. Self-confidence and self-concept can also be impacted. Children might learn that they have to wait for different objects or stimuli to be presented to them, which can cause them to be over-dependent on others for functional tasks. It's really important to allow a child time to learn how to complete tasks in the most independent way possible. The more independent a child is allowed to be, the more confident and empowered they feel. It's okay if it takes longer or if it's not perfect when a student's learning a new skill. I always try to use verbal directional cues if I can before moving on to hand-under-hand assistance. 
when children are unable to imitate what they observe, it impacts their ability to participate in functional and imaginative play. Children need to have experience with real objects and tools first to provide information on how they work and function before using them in play schemes with peers. Parallel and solo play is typical in toddlers, but as children get to preschool age, play becomes more social. Children with visual impairment often get stuck using exploratory methods such as mouthing, which limits their ability to play with others and leads to fewer social experiments, experiences. So, the lack of incidental learning also affects their ability to participate in self-care tasks. On top of that, caregivers or providers want to help or are in a rush, so they complete tasks for the child. This can contribute to learned helplessness. It's important to step back and give the child extra time. With more practice, they'll get faster. The expanded core curriculum fills in the gaps that are created by the lack of incidental learning. This curriculum is tailored to students with visual impairment and highlights skills that need to be explicitly taught. It goes beyond ELA, math, arts, social studies, et cetera. As OTs, we have a significant role in helping students access the core curriculum in all nine components of the ECC. As in any setting, a team-based approach is crucial to supporting students with visual impairment. It can impact all occupations and all components of their curriculum. Therefore, OTs are a key player in any school-based team. Communication with the student's team is vital to understanding the student's strengths and areas of need across multiple settings. For some of the youngest students at Perkins, the IEPs are completely integrated with shared goal areas and objectives in order to really focus on the skills that the child needs to, to succeed in school. For example, for an objective centered around working with a student to place an item into a finish bin when they'd like to terminate an activity, an OT might work on the visual motor aspect of placing an item in the bin, and a speech therapist might work on the communication component. 25% of children in the United States have undiagnosed visual impairment. Many of us as OTs will be referred students without an accurate vision diagnosis that is impacting their functional skill development. Use caution and take these steps to ensure proper diagnosis and development of an appropriate plan of care for the student. The first step is to observe the student. Do they blink excessively or rub their eyes during or after visual activities? Do they tilt their head or angle their chair while looking at their work? Do they avoid tasks involving near or far visual stimuli? To screen the student, have the student read functional text. Observe their ocular motor skills and complete a visual screen that includes fixation, pursuits, and saccades. Then refer a student to an optometrist or ophthalmologist for evaluation and recommendations. Use visual accommodations recommended by the provider to inform the scope and approach for intervention. Vision-based diagnosis will impact the way you perform your evaluation. Most standardized assessments do not account for the nature of a vision impairment. Therefore, the scores are likely to not reflect accurately the child's true abilities or skill deficit areas. It's key to modify your evaluation approach and utilize a variety of qualitative methods to support your findings and plan of care. It is also important to consider other factors related to the student's diagnosis that could affect their ability to perform during an evaluation. For example, assessing visually based skills following a long day of academic instruction would not provide an accurate picture of the child's skills because they'd likely be experiencing visual fatigue. Try your best to minimize clutter in the workspace to support the student's visual attention toward testing materials. If the student presents with a preference for a certain color or does best with high contrast materials, incorporate these into the setting whenever possible. Based on specialist recommendations, incorporate light into testing to spotlight or backlight materials. You can use an iPad or light box if possible. If the student has difficulty recognizing novel items or generalizing visual classifications, 
use familiar tools and symbols in testing. If the testing includes both visual and non-visual assessments, alternate between them to prevent visual fatigue and give the student a break when possible. Use larger items or large print materials when possible to support the student's access. If a student is a braille reader or cannot access written instructions, read them aloud. If testing involves a written component for a student who does not write, describe their responses when possible. Initial visual screen can support referral for more thorough evaluation of visual status. OT assessment focuses on how vision impacts functional skill development, including fine motor, gross motor, ADLs and IADLs, sensory processing, and motor planning. When incorporating aspects of traditional assessments, it's important to consider accommodations that need to be made to the tools themselves and implications that they will have on the results. This list includes a variety of assessment tools and curricula developed for students with visual impairments. They help support access and learning opportunities and developing living skills. If you're providing interventions for students with ocular visual impairments, it's important to consider the following factors. Are high contrast materials being used when applicable? Are fonts and materials provided in an accessible size? Is the lighting in the room adequate for visual attention? Is there a glare that may impact visual access? Does the student have an optimal visual field to be mindful of when presenting items? Is the learning environment supportive of the student's visual attention to the task? And how can the materials be accessed using multi-sensory input? When working with students with CVI, you will have different considerations to factor into your intervention. For example, does the child have a preferred color for visual targets? If not, are you using bright and saturated colors for testing materials? Students with CVI perform best when working with objects with simple patterns or colors on their surfaces. Are there ways that you can use movement to help child, the child visually attend to materials that are utilized in the evaluation? In the absence of physical movement, shiny and reflective surfaces can also create the illusion of movement and grab their attention. Is there movement in the background that could be distracting them from the task at hand? Similar to movement, light can help draw attention to an object, but can also be a distraction if it's in the background, such as bright overhead lights or sunlight seeping through the blind, in through the blind. Be sure to provide extra time between cueing to allow the child to process the visual information. The child's vis visual responses may be slow or frequently delayed. During the time before a response is exhibited, the child with CVI may act as though no visual target is present. However, if sufficient wait time is permitted, the child may eventually turn in the direction of the target and localize or fixate on the object. Children with CVI have also been observed to have atypical reflexes, including not blinking when you come too close to the eyes or delayed protective blink responses. The child may ignore information present in certain areas of their visual field, or they may turn their heads to view objects from a particular portion of their field of view. Visual field preferences are present in almost all children who have CBI. When a child must complete an activity in their central field, such as a writing activity, try using a slant board to lift up the paper to eye level. Be sure that you're presenting testing materials at an appropriate distance for the student. Note if the child is bringing the object within inches of their eye when attending to visual targets. Are you using new objects or materials for the student? Can you try to incorporate familiar materials into the assessment as well to support their visual needs? Because looking requires so much effort, Coordinating, looking, and reaching can be really challenging for individuals with CVI. Children will often look first, then look away to reach. 
keep this in mind when you're asking students to perform visual motor activities. As Anna mentioned, when considering and planning interventions, it's important to be mindful of task and material modifications to support students with visual impairments. I'll elaborate further on these in a moment. Surprisingly, accommodations for CBI are often contradictory to those used for low risk vision related to ocular deficits. Common accommodations for students with low vision involve increasing the size of text or materials, using bold and pronounced lines or objects, choosing colors with high contrast, reducing clutter in the space, minimizing use of patterns, and ensuring that lighting is ample with reduced glare. Be mindful of excessive environmental sensory components, which may be overwhelming. To support students with total blindness, it's key to include multi-sensory components in learning as frequently as possible. This enhances learning and understanding of materials in an accessible manner. Again, be mindful of including excessive or overwhelming sensory factors. While teaching or demonstrating novel skills, provide explicit instruction and explanation of the material, its components, and all aspects of the task or environment. Working within a defined workspace can be helpful in facilitating success and ease of locating items. An example would be to place materials on a tray with pronounced edges or to place small items such as beads into a dish or a bowl. This facilitates the students learning to organize and locate those materials systematically. When working with a student with CBI, it's important to utilize supports and individualized recommendations developed for the student as outlined in their CBI evaluation report. Be mindful of the student's processing time. If it's noted that they require ample time to visually recognize an object, minimize prompting and give them the time to focus and visually locate the object before moving on. Utilize the student's preferred colors to maximize visual recognition whenever possible, especially when orienting to new tasks, environments, and sequences. Red and yellow are often common preferred colors as they're typically the easiest for the brain to process, but each student is unique and this may vary. Work with a simple background whenever possible. Minimize clutter, remove or cover up hanging wall posters, and consider using a plain black or white work surface when possible. For example, when working on self-feeding with a student with CBI, I position her wheelchair facing a plain dark wall and I hold her red spoon in front of this background when presenting it to her to facilitate reaching. Similarly, minimize visual complexity of materials by providing one or two items at a time. Use the student's individual guidelines about the level of visual complexity that they are able to process. Using a flashlight or a backlit surface, such as a light box or a tablet, can be helpful in drawing the student's attention to a particular object. Reduce ambient lighting and distracting glare in the room by turning off overhead lights and closing the blinds if possible. Additionally, try and schedule activities in a manner that allows for breaks between vision heavy tasks to prevent visual fatigue and maximize learning capacity. As we know, children generally succeed best in skill development in an environment where they feel comfortable, engaged, and supported. Much of this is facilitated by rapport development, which may be challenging for students with visual impairments as they might miss out on incidental rapport building opportunities. It's critical that we incorporate blind etiquette into our practice as OTs. Greet your students and identify yourself every time that you see them. For example, hello, this is Molly. Do not assume that they recognize your voice without an introduction. Imagine hearing movement around you, but have little understanding of what is happening. This would be uncomfortable for any of us. Be sure to narrate what is going on in the environment. If you get up to walk across the room, if someone enters the room, let someone know, uh, let the student know what is happening around them. Be clear with your instructions, including directionals. Rather than telling the student, the backpack hooks are over there, 
you could say the backpack hooks are on the wall to your right at shoulder height. Incorporating clear directionals and body schemes into your intervention tasks helps to build comfort as well. Always ask students before providing tactile assistance and cues or prior to moving closely into their space. This respects their autonomy and allows them to set boundaries that they are comfortable with. On this note, be mindful of a student's sensory sensitivities. If applicable, provide them cues and information about what an object, activity, or environment might feel like prior to beginning. For example, if you know that they're sensitive to sounds or crowded environments, give them a heads up before entering a, a, a busy area and show respect for their pre preferences. Students with visual impairments rely on a variety of sensory modalities for learning and engagement in their environment. Multi-sensory materials facilitate uh, skill building. Therefore, if a student also presents with sensory processing difficulties in one or more areas, self-regulation, activity tolerance, and motor learning may be significantly more challenging. So be mindful of this in your treatment planning. Vestibular and proprioceptive interventions play a major role in building body awareness and coordination, especially for our students with visual impairments. This will help them to keep track of where their body is in space, despite low or no visual input. Include linear movement and weight bearing or heavy work activities regularly throughout the student's day within a sensory diet to help build self-regulation and functional sensory skills. Whenever possible, help your students learn to identify and advocate for their sensory processing preferences. Helping your student to learn to advocate for their sensory needs or to explain why they move in the way that they do will become important in improving their independence with self-advocacy and self-determination. This helps to build on foundational skills to facilitate their maximum independence. Use caution when providing instructions in the use of sensory equipment. Students with visual impairments may benefit from additional education about the use of sensory equipment and the safety precautions in a sensory motor space. Provide your student with clear boundaries and guides to ensure their safety. Showing them around a space and identifying possible hazards can be helpful. Many commonly used strategies and tools for teaching and developing self-regulation, such as the zones of regulation and various scales with images, are visually based. These can be inaccessible or very abstract to students with low vision, blindness, or CBI. While helpful, these tools are often complex and visually cluttered, requiring ample visual attention and processing, which can be fatiguing or impossible for some of our students. For example, while a student with a visual impairment may be able to visually access imagery for one zone at a time, a chart with all four zones and several forms of imagery for each, such as the one pictured here on this slide, can be confusing and exhausting. It doesn't sound like it would be a successful learning situation. But the good news is that there are many creative ways to make these tools accessible for your students with visual impairments. At Perkins, we regularly use tactile, tangible symbols, such as those pictured here, to work with our students with low vision or blindness. It's sometimes, or it's important to collaborate with the student's speech language pathologist in order to ensure consistency in symbol use and to understand whether terms are appropriate for the student's communication needs. Tangible symbols can be helpful for students uh, who communicate using a variety of expressive modalities. Tangible symbols may appear abstract to sighted individuals. It may seem obvious uh, to us to use a tactile smiley face for the symbol happy, but for students with visual impairments, this may be confusing. So instead, at Perkins, we use a symbol with a piece of bubble wrap to signify happy, because who doesn't love a little pop, pop, pop? Introduce these symbols systematically and in a consistent manner with their interdisciplinary team to facilitate learning and association with experienced feelings and situations. Ensure that a student's sensory-focused tangible symbols and any sensory tools are easily accessible and that they travel with the student at all times. We've often put together um, a sensory bag for our students, including items such as chewies, fidgets, vibration tools, 
compression vests, lotion, headphones, and other regulating items. This kit often also includes relevant tangible symbols so the student can communicate their sensory needs at any time. Tactile discrimination is very important for our students' access to the environment and learning materials. For Braille learners, tactile discrimination is especially significant in developing pre-Braille learning skills. Incorporate frequent opportunities for developing tactile discrimination skills in your intervention for students with visual impairments. Introduce these tasks in a supportive and non-threatening manner. Follow the student's lead whenever possible. You can use games such as sensory bins or tactile puzzles to increase tactile exploration and awareness. Start with simple games, working to distinguish between one or two items in a sensory bin. Build on their understanding of textures, objects, and shapes through continued learning opportunities. As a student encounters a new item or texture, use descriptive language to educate them and explain the salient features of the item. We often use active learning principles at Perkins, giving our students ample time to explore functional everyday items of different materials, going at their own pace and learning about items, actions, and features. Over time, this helps to develop the students' tactile discrimination and associations with various tools or objects. If you're working with a student who presents with poor tactile discrimination skills, keep in mind that they may not be able to accommodate for that with their vision as some do. Provide them with organizational strategies, such as keeping items in consistent locations in their backpack to support their success and independence in locating these materials. Students learning pre-Braille skills at the first level should be working on skills such as finger isolation, body awareness, spatial awareness, tactile discrimination, and tactile object recognition. Focusing on increase, or focus on increased manual dexterity, intrinsic hand strength, PIP and MIP uh, joint stability to facilitate in-hand manipulation skills and finger isolation. Help the student to, uh, distinguish between their fingers by name and by number, so that way they can build on this when eventually learning how to read and or produce braille materials. Instruct and practice directionality and body schemes with activities such as Simon Says, obstacle courses, or stacking and constructing with blocks. Provide ample opportunities for tactile exploration to increase recognition of and sensitivity to objects, tactile components. Describe the uh, textures and the materials. Use weight bearing and exposure to other sensory inputs to increase the student's registration when possible. Students learning pre-Braille skills at the second level should be learning to use tangible symbols and developing their tracking, sequencing, and sorting skills. Activities involving things like pegboards, wiki sticks, stringing beads, and sorting objects into an ice cube tray can provide opportunities for building these foundational skills. For Braille learners at the third level, the key is to focus on providing the student with meaningful opportunities to explore Braille materials and words. Include Braille in your treatment sessions with activities such as scavenger hunts, using functional labels for routines, or cooking using a Braille recipe. Get creative and have some fun with it. Developing fine motor skills for children with visual impairments who are learning at the preschool age or younger begins with exploration and play. Functionality is even more important to promote fine motor development of students with visual impairment or blindness as they require physical context and direct experience to learn without visual incidental learning opportunities. As mentioned previously, Dr. Lily Nielsen's active learning approach supports foundational motor, uh, fine motor skill development, including grasp, intentional release, finger movement and isolation, in and out movements, and together or apart positions. Methods used in active learning include hanging functional everyday items from a sturdy frame on the wall or inside a little room. These tools should involve multi-sensory modalities for play involving various materials and textures, vibration, sound, lights, and even smells. The OT's role in active learning is to allow the student or child to explore these materials at their own pace, 
giving them quiet time to process the inputs. In a non-disruptive manner, the OT should describe what the student is feeling using salient descriptive terms about the features and helping the child to make connections such as cause and effect of movements. When working with children with visual impairments at the school aged level to build fine motor skills, focus on addressing fine motor skills that are needed for academic and self-care tasks at school. For students with blindness, handwriting is generally not a common intervention focus. However, an OT might work with a student to help them learn how to write their initials or their name or to use a signature stamp. An OT might also consult with the student's TVI to support them in using a slate and stylus to write braille in a low-tech manner. Students with low vision may still use handwriting in day-to-day -day life. Using a multi-sensory approach, such as handwriting without tears, wiki sticks, raised line paper, bold line paper, writing guides, or textured clipboards may be helpful. Provide worksheets with visually simple, high contrast, large fonts, and imagery. Students with visual impairments may benefit from using tangible materials while learning about abstract concepts such as math. Work with a student's team to identify the need for adapted classroom materials such as adapted scissors, high contrast glue, a 2020 pen for writing, or a dot marker for selecting their answers rather than circling them. An OT might support a student with visual impairments in developing fine motor skills for using technology to access their assignments and academics. Some students may benefit from using a high contrast keyboard, a large print keyboard, or a braille keyboard for typing. Others might be learning to use a braille note taker to document their assignments and access their email. Some might benefit from learning to use the accessibility features such as voice to text for dictating rather than typing. Students with visual impairment may be working on their uh, finger isolation and bilaterality for use of high-tech devices. Consultation with an assistive technology specialist or a TVI can be helpful in identifying other technology accommodations for students with visual impairments who are looking to develop their fine motor skills. As with most routine-centered learning, students with visual impairments learn best within their natural environment. Address the fine motor skills needed for successful engagement in ADLs and IADLs that naturally take place at school. These might include grasp for efficient utensil use, bilateral coordination for zipping and buttoning a jacket, or opening food containers for simple snack preparation. Incorporating adaptive strategies and aids for visual impairments as needed. These might include a color highlighted zipper pull or a high contrast container lid. Collaborate with the interdisciplinary team and the student's family to ensure carryover and generalization of fine motor skills associated with the functional routines across classes and settings. Encourage self-determination for the student to complete tasks independently whenever possible. For sighted students, using a pegboard could be good fine motor practice, as long as the motor pattern ends up eventually translating to the student learning how to put a key in a keyhole or a belt prong through a belt hole. However, for students with visual impairments, they're more likely to learn a specific motor pattern within the natural functional context, as they lack incidental learning that may occur through the use of vision. So usually, skip the board and head straight to those keys and keyholes. Adapt functional tools and activities to accommodate the student's visual impairment and learning needs. Many diagnoses with visual impairments also include executive functioning deficits as well. Additionally, learned helplessness is common for students with visual impairments. Students typically require assistance with ADLs and IADLs, especially while first learning and building these skills. Additionally, Families are sometimes unsure of how to address and introduce novel skills, especially if there's a perceived safety risk. I've worked with middle school age students who are quite capable and skilled cognitively and motorically, yet still haven't attempted tasks such as completing their grooming routine or participating in a simple meal preparation activity, as their families were just simply unsure of how to proceed and instruct these skills. In these situations, Executive functioning deficits or lack of exposure to complex tasks 
often require OT support to help the student and their family develop routines and adopt existing systems to suit their skills. An OT might help the student learn to organize their space and belongings or work with them to create schedules and strategies for sequencing these tasks. Some useful tools in addressing executive functioning for students with visual impairments include using simple visual schedules, building schedules with tangible symbols or braille labels, and developing organizational tools using individualized CVI components, if applicable. With these tools, your students will be empowered to practice and implement organizational strategies for success in managing transitions and daily sequences. Beyond modifying interventions themselves, environmental adaptations can also be key to support success across settings. If you've taught a student how to use various accommodations in direct OT sessions that aren't being utilized in the classroom or at home, they may present with less success and independence completing the same skills in those environments. The priorities, as with any population, are safety and function. This is especially important for students with vision impairment as they may miss cues or factors in the environment that pose potential hazards. In some cases, this means explicit orientation to the environment, ensuring familiarity with the location and general layout of the classroom or school space that they're accessing. When possible, this also includes consultation with the orientation and mobility specialists to understand the student's baseline skills when it comes to navigating familiar environments and techniques to help in those that are less familiar. As much as possible, maintaining consistency and predictability within environments will reduce anxiety and allow the student to regularly experience success and independence rather than having to rely on help from staff or peers. This includes closing doors and cabinets, pushing in chairs, and storing items in the same location. Additionally, if the setup of the classroom needs to be changed for any reason, be sure to tell your students so that they can expect the change and adjust as needed. Make sure to also establish and maintain organization. This includes leaving areas decluttered, using bins and individualized labels for personal materials or classroom supplies so that the student will always know where to find them, as well as defining the student's workspace with a tangible or high contrast boundary to keep all materials within reach. When thinking about function, we think about function over form. Excessive decorations, colorful, colorful artwork, stickers, stamps, all of these may be visually appealing to those at sight, uh, but they may be visually overstimulating or distracting to students with low vision or CDI. So this doesn't necessarily mean you have to eliminate them entirely, but even covering the wall that your student's desk faces with a black sheet uh, or using a black trifold board at the edge of their desk will significantly reduce complexity within their line of vision. Lastly, we want to think about accessible labeling. Labeling materials, areas of the room, containers, personal belongings provides individuals with greater independence, again, as they don't need to rely on help from others. These labels can be placed on backpacks, cubbies, chairs, classroom supplies, anything that sighted students may be expected to locate and distinguish. The type of label will depend on the student's skill level and type of vision impairment. So for example, a student with CVI at an early developmental level might be using a red bristle block to serve as a visual and tactile label for their name. Uh, whereas a student who's learning Braille might benefit from a Braille label, um, and a student with low vision might prefer a label written in bold font in a preferred font size. Here we have an example of some simple adaptations an OT might make outside of the classroom that might greatly increase a student's independence throughout their day. In this case, modifying a student's locker may greatly in increase their ability to access and manage their belongings. Again, adaptations are going to be specific to the type of vision impairment. In both cases, you want the student to be able to orient themselves to the locker. So for a student with ocular vision impairment, this might involve using physical landmarks. Uh, so saying the first locker to the right of the water fountain or the last locker at the end of the hallway and having a tactile or braille label to designate ownership. A student with CVI, this might involve using a visual cue, uh, using a highly saturated color to highlight the location or the handle or the lock to draw their visual attention. In both cases, you want to maintain organization. This includes having shelves or bins to make sure everything has and stays in its place, and especially for CVI, making sure to limit any clutter to reduce complexity. The bathroom at school is another location that may need to be adapted outside of the classroom. 
especially in school bathrooms, which are mostly white porcelain or tile, the lighting plays a huge role and you'll want to reduce glare. Again, the kind of adjustment will depend on the type of vision impairment. You might want to ensure that the space is amply lit for some students with ocular vision impairment, while students with CVI might benefit from reducing the overhead light and instead highlighting touch points and manipulatives, such as the flush handle, the faucet, or the hand dryer. In either case, some adaptations will be universal, such as trying to avoid white appliances on white countertops uh, and storing movable items, so the step stool, soap, or trash in consistent and predictable places. In any setting, the more a student can access their environment and learn to care for themselves ultimately means less assistance they'll need as an adult and the least restrictive the living situation will be. When thinking about teaching ADLs, the focus here is teaching developmentally appropriate skills and having and setting clear expectations. Before teaching a skill, we want to consider the performance skills needed uh, and developmental level to avoid a trained skill uh, in which the student can only perform the task if prompted to do so. For these students, it's best to teach these skills within the context and using the real materials, making sure to adapt the context or task to be comfortable, accessible, sensory friendly, and predictable, overall conducive to learning while preserving the real context. To do so, we want to encourage exploration of materials while providing explicit narrative. So allow the student to explore the environment, objects, and tools for the task, and as the OT, using the salient features and descriptions as the student explores, explaining the parts of the object and what they do. One of these objects might become their object of reference, which is the item associated with an activity that represents that activity to the child. This object of reference can later be used as a tangible symbol or a 2D symbol when creating a written schedule. While it is beneficial to expose the student to a skill in its entirety, this can be overwhelming to students with vision impairment. Remember, without that incidental learning, this might be the first time they're exposed to these skills. Therefore, it's often helpful to break down the task into smaller steps. On top of traditional forwards or backwards chaining, students with vision impairment may require hand overhand or hand underhand technique when learning new skills. This provides an opportunity for the students to feel your hands completing the task to help them learn the sequence and motor patterns involved. In any approach, we want to be mindful of the types of cues and pacing of cues and descriptions provided, making sure that we're using clear terminology and directionals so the student can plan or make adjustments appropriately. Creating written routines can also be helpful for both the student and any other adult who might be providing assistance to that student. Routines should follow the typical sequence and steps of a task using the student's preferred rhythm. They should explain the level assistance needed, if any, for each step, and specific and consistent cues to facilitate independence and ensure the student's autonomy. Most importantly, they should be provided in an accessible format, whether that's braille or large print or even read aloud for the student to review themselves. The key here is to be patient, remembering that so much of what we know was incidentally learned through vision and therefore exposure and repetition of these tasks with gradual building on skills will be key for developing these novel motor plans in the presence of a vision impairment. Though we are hopeful that remote learning is a thing of the past, it provided an opportunity for us to examine how we can best provide support in any context and across platforms. Remote sessions present an especially unique challenge to our students, not only in how they access materials, but in how they access the remote instruction in general. So when planning OT telepractice with students with vision impairment, we wanna consider how OT sessions translate across screens. So first we think about the environment, think about who is available to help the student within their space. We wanna consider safety factors related to planned activities and needed materials, since we won't actually be there. We want to establish effective setup of technology, video, and other devices, like maybe their AAC or their note taker. And you want to be clear about what you as the therapist need to see. Perhaps it's more important to focus the camera on the tabletop and the student's hands rather than on their face. And you might need to get creative to ensure an optimal setup, depending on what device they're logging in from. When thinking about materials, we want to use what's available. So being in the student's home is a unique benefit of remote learning, especially for this population who do learn best in their natural contexts. 
So providing a list of materials ahead of time, this can be done in a, in a couple ways, sending a weekly list for all sessions, making it an activity for the student to develop a toolbox of common OT items uh, that they use within the home, learning where those items are within their house, or providing a kit of materials to the family, including familiar tools from school. When thinking about materials, it's also crucial to plan a backup idea for situations in which the student doesn't have the intended materials available or doesn't have the adequate support to access those materials. Beyond uh, activities, we also wanna think about the accessibility of the platform. So be mindful of your own background. If you're using a virtual background to limit the clutter from your own environment, make sure it's something plain and doesn't add additional distraction. You also want to think about lighting. Lighting should be directly on you, not coming from behind you. And be mindful of what you're wearing. Perhaps choose a bright color to draw visual attention to you, or alternatively, a dark, non-distracting shirt, or maybe even just keeping your video off entirely to not draw attention away from the activity. Lastly, take advantage of this unique opportunity to collaborate with the family and have a conversation with the caregivers as early as possible. Talk about materials, challenges at home, those that might impact participation in sessions, um, and scheduling. If scheduling is flexible, maybe OT can be provided during the natural routines, such as meal times or hand washing, toothbrushing. If not, think about what routines could take place naturally during your designated time. Overall, remember to provide clear expectations for the family and their involvement in the session, including how much support you'll need from them and how to provide that support. Beyond remote OT sessions, OTs have a unique role in providing consult for classroom teachers to support their virtual instruction of students with vision impairment. To do so, it's key, again, to plan ahead as much as possible. So this includes planning with the instructor, considering what materials are required for their classes, tools that they're gonna be used, uh, using virtual games, uh, and what kinds of adaptations need to be made ahead of time for the students with vision impairment. It also includes working with the student and family to set up a designated workspace, keeping in mind their visual needs and complexity of the environment around them. So siblings, animals, anyone else in the room. OTs can also provide support with technology. Understand the technology that your student has available to them and how the instructor's technology might present to your student. This involves learning about and sharing the adaptive features of virtual teaching tools, of so screen sharing, whiteboard use, remote control, as well as sharing adaptive features of virtual learning tools with your students, keyboard shortcuts, uh, using gallery versus speaker view, increasing or decreasing the brightness of their screen or keyboard. As with any session, collaboration with the team is crucial. So working with the teacher, the TBI, assistive technology specialists, and other team members to understand the needs of the student um, and establish uh, how to create accessible lessons. So maybe that's using a student's uh, preferred color, preferred font size, appropriate presentation, et cetera. Recognizing also the importance of parental involvement and connecting with families often. And of course, incorporating the student's perspective as often as possible and appropriate. Sometimes in understanding the needs of the students, simple considerations can be made to increase the accessibility of the platform and the instruction. So for example, within presentations, using that simple solid colored background with high contrast of appropriate writing in high contrast materials. So pencil is difficult to see in person and can be even more difficult to see virtually. Using bright, high contrast and solid colored manipulatives over screens. Using familiar materials so you can make logical connections between items presented and items in the activity. Building consistency and routine. So virtual learning is challenging as it is and predictability can help. As the team prepares to use remote platforms, OT can support specific considerations during that planning process. So for example, you might wanna set aside additional time to build relationships, uh, connection, rapport with your students and, your, and their care partners. Even if you've known each other for, for a while, this is a totally new way of engaging and it's likely that others that these others will play a large role within your student sessions or classes, as many students with vision loss require that hands-on support. As a part of a backup plan, also consider preparing accessible asynchronous activities that the student can access independently in the event of unexpe unexpected issues with technology uh, and get to know common accessibility features in case you do need to problem solve on the spot. When it comes to activities, many can be adapted to be non-visual and work in a virtual context, provided this planning. 
external tools and cognitive strategies like timers and checklists, these can easily be translated to a digital format. ADLs and IADLs can be worked on within their context, and materials from home can always be modified. Overall, get creative. Remote learning can be a unique snapshot into the context, into a context apart from school, and can be an opportunity to generalize the skills that you've been working so hard on or identify gaps that you wouldn't have otherwise known. Whether you're in person or conducting remote sessions, there are a variety of items available to support learning and development of functional skills. Websites like Independent Living Aids, Maxi Aids, the Carroll Center for the Blind have adapted materials specific to this population. For example, there are modified mealtime materials such as a built up edge or plate guard to minimize spilling when scanning with a utensil, or a wide edge knife can be used as a pusher or a border for scooping food onto a fork or spoon. Uh, there's an audible liquid level indicator that provide an audible alert or vibration when liquid approaches the edge of a cup while pouring. High contrast, large print measuring cups and keyboards, uh, talking wand to read labels of medication, food items, and classroom bins. Bump dots to serve as tactile markers, and braille Legos to facilitate pre-braille skills. If you are working on a budget or making home recommendations, almost anything can be adapted using simple everyday objects and tools available for purchase at affordable prices. For example, color tape, so electrical tape or duct tape uh, or shiny mylar can be applied to learning materials, doorways, belongings, or touch points to increase contract, contrast and visual attention to objects. Cabinet bumpers, Velcro, puppy paint, all of these can be used as tactile markers. Foam tubing in a high contrast or preferred color can be used to build up handles and other materials for grasp development. And Sharpies can be used to add contrasting color and bold lines to handouts and learning materials. When considering if a student requires intervention at a specialty school, we wanna remember that the ultimate goal is to keep the student in the least restrictive environment. So before making a referral out of one's home district, we wanna consider in what ways is the home or sending district not meeting the educational needs of the student? And ask what the team, family, student is hoping to get out of the referral. Is the team looking for additional evaluation and recommendations? Are they looking for support for accessing the curriculum within the home district? Uh, before making a referral, OTs can refer to educational resources to seek support in intervention planning. If a student is still not accessing their curriculum with support from the team, it may be appropriate to seek outside evaluation to determine those next steps. There are many established organizations and schools that can provide support with assessment and intervention planning. Their websites provide webinars and resources for school-based practitioners, and it may also be helpful to connect, to contact uh, OTs and TVIs within these organizations directly to provide additional individualized recommendations to incorporate into treatment plans. Along with this presentation is a handout that includes some of these resources, um, including additional clinical resources as well as resources for families. Though there are many helpful resources available, current literature on best practice within this population is limited. As Anna mentioned, existing literature largely focuses on older adults through the lens of productive aging. Therefore, additional research is needed to inform best practice in school-aged individuals with vision loss. Specific areas include efficacy of school-based OT interventions with, with school-aged youth versus older adults, with vision loss, as well as standardized assessments for the blind, uh, vision impaired, and deafblind population. With that, we do hope this presentation has provided ideas and resources that can be implemented across settings. But of course, feel free to, to reach out, contact any of us with questions. Thank you so much for your patience and for your time. All right, we'll open it up to questions. The first question coming in, um, when working with a young child with CVI, two and a half years old, what are the best ways to adapt toys? I've thought about outlining shape sorter holes with nail polish or paint or outlining piggy banks, slot with glitter glue or textured paint to help guide students to orient coins to slot correctly. Would these strategies work for CVI? Molly, Anna, either of you want to take that for the younger kiddos or you want me to jump in? I was going to uh, see if Anna wanted to, since that was her specialty. Yeah, so um, 
I think that the nail polish is a good idea. Some other things you can use to adapt are like the foam grip, like Julie showed at the end, um, duct tape, sticky bumps can be helpful um, with the nail polish. So there's some texture and also some color. Um, you can get wrapping paper from the like drugstore or whatever that's shiny or like mylar bags and add that for shine to um, pretty much anything you can find that has like a saturated color or some shine to it, um, foil works even are kind of good ways. I've like taken books and added like sticky rhinestones and things like that to them too to sort of help draw kids' attention. Does that help at all? Oh, All right. So, yeah, no, that's okay. We'll wait for it. If there's a, if they need to follow up, they can respond in the in okay. the questions box. Um, Tanya, it looks like you started to write a question, but I don't think we got the rest of it. All I have is hi. So, if you want to finish up that question, we can answer that. Um, let's see. Okay. So, thank you for this great information. Y'all did a great job, and I appreciate your time. So, we'd love to see these wonderful comments come in. Um, can you please remind me what those cool sensory light up exploration boxes, play areas are called at Perkins? I remember seeing them when I visited Perkins many years ago as an OT student. I think you might be talking about the little rooms. Yeah, that's what I'm guessing. <laughs> Molly mentioned this a little bit in her piece. Um, this is big in active learning. Uh, we don't use them so much in secondary. I work with the older kids. Molly, maybe you want to touch on it a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So uh, little rooms, they um, they come from the active learning principles, um, which is a whole other subject in itself. Um, but active learning allows students to or kids to explore different objects and materials um, as is so that way they can kind of grow their understanding of what different things are. So um, what these structures are that I think you're referring to are known as little rooms. And so it'll be a little box or a, a small little Kind of space that's kind of built for the student size. So for the little, little ones, this might be like a little kind of play space on the floor. Um, we had one built for a student who was around eight or nine at the time. So she was a little bit larger um, and it was maybe like six feet by six feet. And so the walls were all covered with um, like a black kind of plastic um, with holes drilled in it. And so we were able to attach different types of utensils and um, you know fun materials. The student also has CBI, so we included some mylar and some light up objects um, and some fun other sensory, sensory play types of things. Um, and you know they kind of can just sit in there and explore at their own pace. So whether that's laying in prone or supine, um, maybe sitting up and reaching out um, around them, maybe reaching up for things that are hanging down from the ceiling. Um, and or putting their feet in things, kind of just whatever position they want to be in. Um, and it gives the child an opportunity to really learn about their environment at their own pace. So the idea is that the staff with them is, you know, kind of quiet and not speaking, not narrating too much, maybe narrating here and there as they interact with something to help them learn. But um, they're very fun, very cool. So we have a lot of them on our campus. Yes, and Jenna is saying that is it. Thank you. Um, and a follow up from Sarah. She said that thank you. Uh, the play ideas. Uh, I like the idea about the shiny rhinestone. So perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you for all for this information. I also work at Perkins, but as a PT, the information you provided have been very helpful. Do you have strategies for kids with blindness and behavioral issues? We've added many sensory breaks to the day, but there are many um, have been a lot of behavioral issues. Yeah, definitely important to um, consult with the team, consort with, consult with um, the behavioralist on the team. Um, but one big thing, especially with students who um, have total blindness, is to really, again, as Molly mentioned, um, to be mindful of blind etiquette and narrating any noises around, any um, interaction you're going to have with the student. So if there are behavioral issues that require any kind of hands-on support, um, really making sure that you're um, being mindful of entering into someone else's space without letting them know, um, to letting them know who's in the environment, um, other sounds in the environment, anything that might be um, alarming um, or agitating, um, and making sure that you're really being mindful of um, that rapport building and therapeutic use of self. Hey, is there an app uh, on your phone which can be used to describe what the rooms look like? I remember this from Perkins' seminar before. I don't know the name, 
also would something like this work for a student um, with an iPad or tablet for or a school computer? I don't know a specific name of an app off the top of my head, but I do know that there are several in existence and there are some that within the app will describe um, your surroundings or something to you. And then there are others where it's kind of like a um, information sharing type of a platform where you have volunteers who sign up to receive calls or receive input from this app. And then they can then describe that to the individual who's trying to figure out what it is. So if you're at the store and you're figuring out, oh, does this shirt match these pants? And then you can kind of use the app and and, um, and contact somebody for help. Um, so that's a pretty cool uh, option there. Julie, I think you had a couple others. Yeah, we have a lot of students who use these up in secondary. Um, the most popular ones I think we've heard have been um, Tap Tap C, um, Be My Eyes is one of those crowdsourcing ones. And then the one that's that's coming up more commonly is Ira. Um, this involves another um, uh, like smart glasses, but you can also use it just with your phone if you're holding your phone up. Um, it's free in a lot of public areas. So I know in like a lot of main supermarkets, um, airports, things like that, but it actually connects to someone uh, remotely. So I think that the hub is in Chicago or you know somewhere further away uh, and you sign on to Ira and you can either using the glasses, look around the room or using your phone, kind of scan around the room and they'll describe everything in your environment. Um, it's pretty cool. So I know someone ran the Boston Marathon using Ira. Um, it's pretty awesome technology. So that's becoming more popular. Awesome. Okay. I work with a student for OT uh, who has prosthetic eye and low vision, legally blind. The TBI showed me the 2020 pens. They do not appear noticeably different to me. Just wondering what is the difference with other fine, fine point markers? So uh, 2020 pen, um, definitely. I mean, I've had students before who benefit from the use of a 2020 pen. And if we don't have one accessible, you know, using a Sharpie, using another marker can suffice in those moments. Um, these are just specifically designed um, to provide that level of high contrast. Um, but again, you can kind of replicate that elsewhere. Like Julie mentioned in, um, you know, one of her resource slides, there are so all sorts of DIY options that aren't necessarily these like brand name or specialized products that are created for that particular purpose. Um, so using a Sharpie or using another marker, if that's what you have on hand is fine, as long as it is meeting that student's needs. So being mindful, you know, a very fine point marker might not give the student enough contrast or enough of a bold line. You might need to use one that's a little bit thicker. Um, so just kind of playing it by ear with your own student, but that's okay if you don't have an actual 2020 on, on hand all the time, all the time. Yeah, all I think right. it's also important to just be sure to like check the size that you're writing things out to because if it feels like the 2020 pen isn't working you may need to write like bigger mm -hmm. and not just that bold too and check the lighting in the room as well all right many more thank yous and greats coming through another question hi have you ever seen tactile items to use for visual tactile schedule such as a piece of rope to indicate a swing or bubble wrap you mentioned available for purchase anywhere as opposed to making them hmm. i don't, I don't know if seen them for purchase we have um, an assistive assistive device center on campus so a lot of our materials get sourced on site anyway i know our slps um, are amazing at making all of our tangible symbols um, alongside the ADC. So um, I don't know if we've purchased any. I know we use products that um, are purchased. Like not everything is super DIY. Not everything is really abstract. Um, you know, I've seen like little Playmobiles used as little people. Um, but I don't know if I've ever seen any for purchase. Have either of you? No, and that's something I'm looking at right now because I'm not at Perkins anymore. I'm working in, I moved and I'm working in St. Louis and I'm going to start working with some kids with vision impairment in the practice I'm working in. I'm like, how am I going to fill this gap? But the thing about the tactile symbols is that most of them are purchased items kind of fastened onto a board. So if you can sort, sort of get an idea of starting with a couple things that you might want to use, and look around the key that um, our SLPs always told me was to not have a miniature version of something, but to try to have an object of a real size, like a part of an object, a piece of 
bubble wrap or the part of a rope is a great example of something that you could use. So just walking around like the hardware store or Walmart, you could probably find some items. Obviously, that's a lot of time, which I'm also thinking about, but it really, really helps the kids. So it's worth it. And with that, too, you, you know, as we mentioned, it doesn't have to be something that's very specific or very ornate. It really just needs to be something that has meaning for that student. So again, like Anna said, if you're just at the hardware store and if there's something or the craft store or whatever, and there's something that will have meaning that ties to some sort of activity or feeling or task for that student, that's all that really matters. So as long as that is introduced to them from the start um, and it's something that holds that association, that's really, you know, the key. So you can start out with actual objects. You can start out with, you know, putting smaller pieces of objects or symbolic um, feelings and, and materials onto pieces of cardboard, but um, it doesn't have to be something very specific and, and like highly specialized. I think we also have, you know, we have some symbols that are really kind of universal across programs, like symbols that, um, that indicate the OT room versus the PT room. Um, but a lot of our symbols are individualized for the students. So thinking about what item represents an activity to that student. So if, you know, one student, uh, a toothbrush might represent toothbrushing and you might literally cut a toothbrush in half and hot glue it to a cardboard. Um, but another student, maybe it's the toothpaste or maybe it's, uh, you know, a faucet or something else that, you know, helps them uh, know, helps them indicate that, that uh, you know, the routine is coming up, um, it might be different between the different students. So that might be the tricky part about um, purchasing them. Um, you really want to use what's meaningful to the students. Great point. All right. So uh, just a comment kind of question here. In Rhode Island, Rhode Island, the Sherlock Center has provided us with tactile schedules for basic things. So we didn't have to start from the scratch to make all the schedules. Is there a resource center in Mass that might offer that? That's great to know. <laughs> uh, I know that um, at Perkins, we provide a lot of um, resources. There are a lot of um, tools and resources available for purchase. Um, I know as well at the Carroll Center, um, and I'm blanking on the name, but there is a resource center in uh, downtown Boston where you can go in and you can actually try all of the different, um, the, the different tools. Do, Molly, Anna, either of you know the name of this place? I'm not sure. I can I can definitely find out. Um, I'm not sure how we would send something out afterwards. But I'm sure we can. Um, I'm sure we you can, can send it on to me, and we'll post it on our social media pages. Uh, but there's a lot of these kinds of resources listed on that the resource guide that we did include in this presentation. So check those out. Um, Molly, it looked like you were going to say something. I was just trying to I was trying to look it up, but I can't. I don't see anything right off the bat. So we'll get it. I'm trying to look it up too. That sound right. <laughs> All right, so I have a second grade student who's not able to see print or read. The vision therapist has blown up worksheets, which are helpful, but he still struggles. He can see 20 point font print, but has to get really close. Mom has wondered about Braille. What are your thoughts when Braille should be introduced? What's a good family resource? We definitely have students who um, have functional use of their vision who also are learning Braille, um, and that's for a variety of reasons. So sometimes it's parent request, or you know, it's it's something that the family feels passionate about. Um, other times the student might have a um, you know condition that may deteriorate their vision over time, or we're unsure if that might happen. So we want to make sure that they're prepared for whatever may come next. Um, so you know, there's not really a too early kind of a stage for, for that, I don't think. Um, I think that especially if the student is having some trouble accessing visually printed materials, um, they may benefit from starting to learn Braille skills and starting to um, you know, develop that, that side of their understanding because maybe it'll be something that they can use more effectively, more functionally, more fluidly um, to access uh, learning supports like that. Um, I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I also think it's helpful for some students, depending on what the student's um, condition is, to have a, like a backup 
option. So if they're experiencing any kind of visual fatigue um, or if they're in, you know, a, a, an especially dark classroom or it's really cloudy or, or any other factors that are impacting their um, visual access to their printed materials, it's nice to have some kind of backup that they can choose. They can access um, their materials in multiple different ways. Um, so that might be another reason to, to promote the Braille. All right, uh, Comet kind of Easter Sales Device Center. Is that maybe what you were talking about? All right. <laughs> hey, we you. got a friends, group group effort here. Easter Sales Device Center. So folks living in Massachusetts, take note. Uh, yeah, it's very great. Uh, you can go in and, and try different items and then you can take them on loan, um, especially for some of the materials that are really expensive. I know like a CCTV, something that you put um, a piece of print in and it blows it up to a, you know, however much magnification, different lighting, different contrast, whatever you need. Um, those things are really expensive. And so it's helpful to try that kind of stuff out before purchasing it on your own. Um, so Easter Seal is a great resource. Thank you to whomever um, remembered the name. Always a group effort here. We love it. All right. Another question. When you're working with low vision students, do you have a specific way to test check for their response to high contrast material and or can you just explore through trial and error with different materials? Great question. Um, there are some assessments out there um, to look for contrast. Um, functionally, I, I think the easiest way to check for contrast sensitivity is um, just pouring different kinds of um, liquids. So I learned this in grad school, great tool, um, and I continue to use it to this day. So pouring, uh, you know, like chocolate milk into a white cup versus water into a clear glass, um, things like that, milk into a dark glass, anything you have on hand, um, providing, you know, a manipulative, uh, that's similar color to the surface versus providing a really high contrast one and see if you notice any differences. See if you notice them like getting, you know, down to eye level, see if you notice the speed in which they reach or, or interact with the item. Um, if there's any mess, spills, knocking things, um, behavior often um, gives you some good insight. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a student with septo-optic dysplasia. Currently, she's working on functional skills like zipping a coat. Do you have any tips on how to initiate the process as she has limited movement of her hand? Excellent question. Um, something that we'll start out with a lot of times, especially depending on a student's motor capabilities, um, is using adapted or kind of enlarged materials for, for things like that. So um, if you're working on having the student start to engage that zipper, um, we have and they're just things that we've gotten like off of Amazon and stuff like that, but like adapted or large zippers. Um, and that can help with that sequencing and that motor planning of understanding that the, you know, one part of the zipper has to go inside of the other one and you have to hold it there before pulling it up. Um, if you're working on just having them pull that zipper up, um, a lot of times we'll, you know, use either duct tape or some sort of a zipper pull um, and we'll make it built up and larger using some of that high contrast, high saturation, um, preferred colors, if applicable, um, to help the student notice where that zipper pull is or be able to feel it better with their hands. Um, and then on top of that, that larger handle or that larger pull tab can help them to grasp it better um, when pulling that up. Um, but definitely it is a balance between kind of understanding where their visual status is and their motor capabilities. Great. I used to I... use, um, oh, sorry. No, um, go for it. I used to use like the binder rings of different sizes to sort of scale down the zipper pull. So start with a really big one. And that's also nice if the child does have some vision because they're shiny. And then as the kid gets better at pulling it, you can put on smaller binder rings. And most people have those like lying around school anyway. So it's like a cheap adaptation for the pulling part at least. 